The one-time sacrifice of Jesus on the cross replaced the ongoing demand for continual sacrifices to obtain atonement for one's ongoing propensity to sin. Shalom and welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Josh Weiss, and today we're wrapping up our series based on the book, God, Forgive Me? It's by my father, Dr. Randy Weiss. We've been at this for a while now. We're actually now on our 10th and final episode of the series. And if you missed some or any of these past episodes, you can find them all on our YouTube channel. Just search Crosstalk TV. We post all of our weekly programming there, so you can catch up if you, if you missed it. And of course, you can subscribe if you don't already. If you didn't already know, this series asks and answers the question, what does it take for God to forgive us? The easy answer is Jesus. He died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. This is common knowledge for Christians. What we're aiming to do with this particular series is going a little deeper and showing you why Jesus' sacrifice is able to forgive us of our sins. If you fully understand the why, then it makes it so much uh, more powerful and meaningful. In the last episode, we ran out of time and had to pause things right as my dad was about to tell a story. We're picking up right where we left off. So let me give you just a little bit of context. My dad likes to keep a journal and what he's about to reference from, it comes from one of his journals. Both of my parents were in Paris, France when this took place. So let's jump right in and hear that story. What I wrote was, Lord, as I sit here outside a lovely French cafe, drinking delicious French coffee, enjoying a glorious Paris morning, allow me to give thanks. Thank you, Lord. My sins are forgiven. Your atonement is perfect. Your grace is sufficient. Last night, I saw a Jewish family throwing breadcrumbs into the canal. By the way, that beautiful canal was connected to the equally beautiful Seine River. And this Jewish family was performing the ritual known as Tashlich. They were throwing bread into the river in an effort to fulfill a perceived religious duty. The Hebrew prophet Micah wrote of God's willingness to pardon iniquity. Micah declared that God was willing to let go of his righteous anger. Scripture says, He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will again have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. In one sense, this was an extremely tender and beautiful experience to witness. In another, it was a very humorous scene. An explanation is required with a request that you don't judge me for what I'm about to say. My wife has already done that. The canal was lined with young people. This was clearly the center of the local Paris social scene. Street side cafes with outdoor seating and local bars dotted the boulevard. The weather was perfect. Men and women paired up over drinks enjoying the Paris scenery and the lovely atmosphere. There happened to be a very conveniently located, yet strange looking public restroom bolted to the concrete. I'd never seen anything like this before. It was a large rounded metal structure operated by a push button. All the instructions were in French, I couldn't figure it out, and I needed to use the restroom. Suddenly, a curved metal door mechanically rolled open. A young lady magically walked out and she began talking to us in French. Eventually, I understood that the button she saw me pushing wasn't ready to activate because the facility she had just used wasn't clean yet. It was in a cleaning mode. I think that translated to something like the toilet was about to be automatically flushed, but it hadn't yet flushed. The other point she was communicating was that my wife and I couldn't enter together. Now, I don't know what the lady was thinking, and for numerous reasons, this just confused us more. By the way, we certainly do live in the 21st century and not being royalty, we empty our own chamber pots, normally with a manual flush mechanism. Now, my wife was more confused and the situation deteriorated into a foreign comedy skit. She earnestly tried to understand, but my wife genuinely couldn't follow the animated volley of unintelligible French explanations with hand gestures and finger pointing. The free-flowing monologue of the young lady was lost on two tourists who just needed to use the restroom. 
But the French gal wanted to make sure we understood that we were not permitted to enter the little tin can together. This was clearly a classic failure to communicate. <laughs> Now, please be assured that my wife is the most proper, respectable, and modest lady you would ever meet. She's a true woman of God with royal character and qualities, but somehow this French lady sufficiently confused my wife into thinking that there must be some kind of sinister public toilet police squad nearby because the subject of a video surfaced. I don't know how. But my wife confounded the young French lady until the gal burst out in hilarious laughter. And then she said in broken English with a wonderful French accent, No, no, there is no camera. It was then that the situation rapidly degenerated from the absurd to the preposterous. The young lady lost all her decorum and nearly cried in laughter. And some of the young singles mingling at the water's side joined in the chorus of giggles. She repeated, no, no video. You're not going to be a porn star in the toilet. <laughs> My wife was humiliated. It was an entirely bizarre moment when the French girl finally explained the obvious that only one person could go into the tin can toilet at a time. And voila, the round tin can finally opened with the push button, the cleaning was apparently complete, but I digress. When I exited the electric toilet that looked like a French prop from a parody of a Star Trek movie, I was struck by the scene I was watching. The Jewish family was completing their prayers and the Tashlich ritual. Standing by the gorgeous canal off the famed Seine River, this young family had a sense of peace and spiritual sanitation that can only come from forgiveness. <sighs> but I believe it was a false sense of righteous purity. Their religious exuberance drew them to feed their sins to the fish by throwing bread into the river. But feeding the fish simply accomplished something purposeful for the fish. It was little more than a spiritual placebo for the family. Our bad behavior requires more than a placebo. Our unkind words, our selfish tendencies, our unacceptable outbursts, our uncanny ability to stretch the truth, and even our pathetic unwillingness to forgive those who have wounded us brings us to the seat of judgment, and our guilt carries a punishment. Sin earns death. Mercy is the only thing that can resolve our greatest problem, the sin problem. Our God delights in mercy. God is willing to let go of his righteous anger. Righteous anger is the sentiment every sinner deserves from God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God is willing to turn from his righteous anger because he delights in mercy. God announced his compassion for us. He has declared his desire to subdue our iniquities. Yet until fully subdued by God, we carry our own burden of iniquities. The weight of those burdens prohibit us from soaring free from anything that binds us to the debilitating gravity of sin, bad habits, and any repeated behavior that scars our mind or our relationships can be overcome. These bonds are no longer inescapable. With the help of God, we gain the advantage over any personal struggle Instead of returning to our wrongdoings like pigs to slop, we can experience true forgiveness. And it won't be a temporary forgiveness that dissipates in the days or weeks following a spiritual experience at our church or synagogue. True forgiveness isn't the momentary sense of peace one may feel after concluding a 24-hour fast or 10 days of so-called penitence. God is willing to subdue our iniquities. He has the power. We must become honest with ourselves and with Him. We are powerless to blot out our own sins from God's ledger on the day of judgment on Yom Hadin, but He has the legal authority to pardon us and turn our guilt into innocence. So here's the question. So how did Tashlik become an acceptable answer for addressing the sin problem among some Jewish people? Well, the answer is that the scriptures do declare, thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. 
Since the 13th century, some observant Jews have deduced from that text that a well-meaning family could stand at the river, chant a few blessings, cast their bread upon the waters, and a fish would swallow their guilt or mysteriously carry their sin burden downstream where it would be eventually lost at sea. Some rabbinic interpretations suggest that the reason we throw bread into the water for the fish is because man cannot escape God's judgment any more than fish can escape being caught in a net. We're just as likely to be ensnared and trapped at any moment as a fish. And that's an interesting perspective. But atonement is unavailable through imaginative rituals. Iniquity is atoned for by mercy and truth. In God's mercy, He has provided a way forward to all who want to have their iniquities purged. God has provided an atonement. This is what everyone needs because everyone has sinned. We are all prone to sin. Everyone does it. As God describes it, there is not a single man in all the earth who is always good and never sins. It comes naturally. Perhaps you've heard it said, Our Father in heaven, lead us not into temptation. I can find it on my own. <laughs> we all have a terminal sin problem. Fish do not provide the life-giving solution we need. Tashlich is a beautiful ceremony to observe, but the sentimental fishy myth that leads to the performance of a ritual on the afternoon of Rosh Hashanah will not secure anyone's atonement. If we believe God's book of life, the Sefer Chaim, is opened at the beginning of our days of awe on Rosh Hashanah and it is sealed during the tenth day on Yom Kippur, our day of atonement, a better plan than Tashlich is needed. Neither fasting nor prayer alone will assure God's forgiveness. Tradition suggests God will reach His judgment about what we will endure in the coming year. It is presumed that His decision will be influenced by our actions during the prior year and how He chooses to answer our prayers during the days of awe. We all have sins on our account. We should all want to have our accounts cleared. We all need a legitimate solution to our sin problem. I think many of my readers would agree that throwing some bread into a river for the fish seems like a stretch of faith. Forgive my coarse analysis, but it reminds me of our conversation with that French lady. Something was lost in translation. And one might crudely say, the rabbinic interpretation degenerates from the absurd to the preposterous. Some people have much for which they should be sorry. If God were to run His video from the camera over our life during the prior year's behavior, we would all be ashamed. Actually, we would be horrified and we would immediately recognize why our sins separate us from God. Throwing bread into a canal is not a solution. True forgiveness will not come from superstition, rote rituals, carrying a rabbit's foot, or wearing a cross. As one of my European friends has said, if Jesus were executed today, many Christians would be wearing little silver electric chairs around their necks instead of crosses. <sighs> Take a look at the cover of my book. It's not the instrument of death that should be honored. It is his willingness to suffer the horror of becoming a sacrifice for unworthy beneficiaries and of God's ability to resurrect Jesus from that gruesome death that is worthy of a Christian's celebration. Hence, the image on the cover was quite intentional. One more cross on the cover of one more book about the Christian view of atonement might have seemed like a cliche. It is the concept of a death penalty for sinners that I wanted to be indelibly etched on this project. The symbols we wear, the rituals we mimic, will not convince God to change His verdict over the guilt we carry for our sins. God desires to show us mercy because we need mercy and has been shown. God delights in mercy, but to obtain His mercy, an atonement is required to clear our accounts with God. Instead of breadcrumbs thrown into the river or growling stomachs on Yom Kippur, God still requires a sinless, perfect, unblemished substitutionary sacrifice I believe He provided His own. From the smallest, least offensive indiscretion to the most egregious, malevolent, hateful behavior on the books, we are all sinners. Whatever your sin of choice, be encouraged that they are all forgivable.
There is no sin beyond God's ability and desire to provide forgiveness. But since he's the only one doing the forgiving, he has the right to determine the protocol. And he has already defined the value of the exchange required in the spiritual transaction that reverses his judgment of us from guilty to innocent. God will irrevocably spare anyone from the eternal punishment due them because of their sins. This is great news. If the temple were still in existence and if the biblical sacrifices were still an option, that protocol would serve well on a temporary basis. The guilt offering would remove one's guilt until more guilt was earned through another sin. Then another sacrificial offering would be required to reverse the guilty verdict again. That cycle of sin and death was unending. You've probably guessed that my view is that the one-time sacrifice of Jesus on the cross replaced the ongoing demand for continual sacrifices to obtain atonement for one's ongoing propensity to sin. The price of atonement understood by Christians is the sinless life of Jesus in exchange for the sinful life led by each of us who believe in this unique spiritual exchange. Feeding the fish, waving a chicken around one's head, giving charity, fasting, and even praying won't resolve that for which a sacrifice is required for resolution. In our modern world, the ancient concept of atonement can be confusing. Perhaps that, that's why God made it clear that an unblemished sacrifice was given for one's atonement. The Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you, making you right with Him. You know, it's all about getting right with God and, well, this requires more than an attitude adjustment. It required an actual death of something deemed pure for our impure lives to be purified. Will God forgive me? Sure, but something or someone must die. God's commitment to us remains intact. He's chosen to love us and to forgive us. The atonement He provided covers a multitude of sins. Believe it or not, His grace even exceeds the crime of surpassing the passenger limits on a French Star Trek public toilet. But I solemnly swear that was never our intention. <laughs> In my introduction to this presentation, I declared that I wanted to avoid anyone suggesting that a subterfuge was afoot. I also wanted to clarify the sorts of readers who might benefit from this conversation or who may be the subject of this research. To sum up my conclusions, I presume that some folks believe God is mysteriously obligated to forgive their guilt because He has no choice. In other words, if we pray for forgiveness, God must forgive us. That's a presumptuous, arrogant, inaccurate viewpoint not supported by the Bible. And as has been discussed throughout this discussion, others believe modern religious rituals will satisfy God. That is also an unrealistic assumption. I mean, there was a time that priestly sacrifices and Levitical rituals would suffice. That era passed shortly after the death of Jesus. Modern rituals will not be received as an equivalent to a legitimate blood sacrifice. There, there is no biblical basis to assume otherwise. And the third group, to which I belong, believes that the dictates of God to Moses do, in fact, require a sacrifice. They also believe that sacrifice was accomplished by Jesus becoming the perfect Lamb of God. And folks in the final group may believe they will end up as the tortured subject of a sad country song. You remember, my dog died, my truck won't crank, I'm out of beer, my bass boat sank. <laughs> if one remains convinced of either of the first two viewpoints, my work has not likely been of much benefit. If the third group represents your beliefs, my work here is done. If you remain in the final group, I want to make a simple appeal. Not all country songs end in heartbreak, though many of the really good ones do. <laughs> you can still choose to reflect the results of a better song. I'm partial to Hank Williams. I saw the light. <laughs> if you do, you can join the Hallelujah Chorus. 
But at this time, without true forgiveness, through the atonement of Jesus on your behalf, that outcome is impossible. Meanwhile, if you haven't yet figured out the category that fits you best, consider that young bull that I told you about much earlier in this conversation. Find your category. I know what I am and I won't be confused with other categories. And I like mine. It saved my life. And like that young bull, I'm going to let everyone know. I mean, it avoids any dangerous confusion. So allow me to exit at this time and just say, Shalom for now. Conclusion. As promised, this is the gut check proposed from the soapbox in the first paragraph of what I discussed with you. Here's the question. What does God say to Israel? And here's the answer. It's right from God. He said, But oh, my people, you won't ask my help. You've grown tired of me. You've not brought me the lambs for burnt offerings. You've not honored me with sacrifices. Yet my requests for offerings and incense have been very few. I've not treated you as slaves. You've brought me no sweet-smelling incense, nor pleased me with the sacrificial fat. No, you have presented me only with sins and wearied me with all your faults. I, yes, I alone am he who blots away your sins for my own sake and will never think of them again. Oh, remind me of this promise of forgiveness, for we must talk about your sins. Plead your case for my forgiving you. From the very first, your ancestors sinned against me. All your forebears transgressed my law. That is why I have deposed your priests and destroyed Israel, leaving her to shame. So, again, I ask the question, what does God think of Israel? And the answer is, he says, for the Lord has chosen Israel as his personal possession. Okay, well, then that raises the question, what does God say to the church? And the answer is, God calls us to become living sacrifices. He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. A modern version says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. So here's the biggest question. What does God say to the presenter, to the author of this work? He says, turn me away from wanting any other plan than yours. Revive my heart toward you as darkness begins to fall around us, covering our society in degradation, I know a hiding place. The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. He's close to those who trust in Him. God says to this speaker, this author, this sinner, God says, trust me. And if not Jesus, then who did the prophet foretell would die for our sins? Scripture says he was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he never said a word. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he stood silent before the ones condemning him. From prison and trial, they led him away to his death. But who among the people of that day realized it was their sins that he was dying for, that he was suffering their punishment? He was buried like a criminal, but in a rich man's grave. But he had done no wrong and had never spoken an evil word. But it was the Lord's good plan to bruise him and fill him with grief. However, when his soul has been made an offering for sin, then he shall have a multitude of children, many heirs. He shall live again, 
and God's program shall prosper in his hands. And when he sees all that it is accomplished, by the anguish of his soul, he shall be satisfied. And because of what he has experienced, my righteous servant shall make many to be counted righteous before God, for he shall bear all their sins. Therefore, I will give him the honors of one who is mighty and great because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was counted as a sinner and he bore the sins of many and he pled with God for sinners. And so we learn from Isaiah chapter 53 about our Savior. As sons and daughters of God, we are children of the cross and heirs of heaven. So here's another question. To whom was God referring when the Hebrew prophet said, you shall do more than restore Israel to me? I will make you a light to the nations of the world to bring my salvation to them too. Who revealed the God of Israel to the nations? The best answer to that question remains the simplest and the most obvious. In fact, discovering the correct answer is better than knowing the answers on who wants to be a millionaire. I have no interest in asking the audience if our entire society agreed but was nevertheless wrong, I would still be personally responsible to have the correct answer. No need to phone a friend. Yes, I needed a lifeline. <laughs> My final answer is Jesus. And just like that, we've covered the entire book I hope that you've enjoyed it along the way. Like I said earlier, if you missed any part of this episode or previous episodes, you can find them all on our YouTube channel, Crosstalk TV. If you'd like to get your hands on one of these books, we've made them readily available for you. All you gotta do is go to our website, crosstalk.org, and you'll be able to order a hard copy or even download a free PDF. Maybe you could even order a copy and donate it to your local library. While you're on our website, I would encourage you, you'll also see some other books and music by my father that you can have access to. And you can check out the other ministries that we operate here at Crosstalk International as well. And hey, if you wanna keep up with Crosstalk moving forward, I highly encourage you, follow us on the major social media platforms with the handle at Crosstalk TV. We post stuff there often and it's easiest uh, to keep in touch with us that way. Lastly, if God's laid it on your heart, a desire to support Crosstalk. The biggest thing that you can do, of course, is to pray for us. We can always use prayer. And if you'd like to donate and help us with the financial needs of this ministry, you can do so at our website as well, crosstalk.org. Or you can call 1-800-688-3422. Of course, you can mail a donation in as well. All donations are tax deductible and, of course, greatly appreciated. Well, that's that's all we've got for this series. We'll catch you up with the next one. And until next time, shalom and God bless.